Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, and um, within the next few minutes, I'm sure that other participants will also join. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for um, for attending this webinar. My name is Alexandra Olson, and I am a project officer at Ina. Um, so uh, yes, I would like to welcome you today to our webinar on the role of local communities in emergency preparedness. So just a bit of background and why we wanted to have this webinar on this particular topic. Um, we are facing uh, increased uh, frequency and intensity of nature-derived and man-made hazards. So the topic of ensuring that communities are prepared to face uh, such events is of utmost importance. So today I'm going to give the floor to three practitioners whose organizations have developed initiatives that not only seek to enhance awareness of risks related to particular disasters, but they seek to actively involve citizens in the process. So um, today I'll be giving the floor to, uh, first and foremost, to uh, Marita Hoafossen. She is the general manager of the Trondheim Red Cross, and she's going to discuss the outcomes of a preparedness exercise that we um, recently had in Trondheim uh, for the Engage project, and this really aimed to enhance the awareness of the local community to the risks that quickly landslides pose through the involvement of local organizations, schools, and through the involvement of the Trondheim Red Cross's Preparedness Guard initiative. And then we will hear from Lika Wright from the Himmelo uh, Industrial Sites and Emeline Roloff from the safety region of South Limburg. And they will discuss their citizen amb ambassador network, which was established with the aim of facilitating information sharing um, in regard to actions that can be taken in the event of a chemical spill. So we hope that um, at the end of this webinar, you'll leave inspired on uh, hearing about these different initiatives. Maybe you'll want to uh, establish a similar initiative in your local context. Um, and I'm looking forward to a very informative uh, webinar. So just a few housekeeping um, um, aspects before we get started. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of um, at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions in the meantime, you can feel free to put them in the chat. Um, or in the Q&A section uh, at the end, I will address your questions uh, to uh, the different uh, panelists today. Um, another aspect, if you would like to have um, captions, they should be automatically generated, but if not, um, there is a, uh, a, if you run your mouse over the bottom of the screen, there should be a little button that says uh, show captions and you can choose captions in the language um, that suits you the best. So um, without further ado, I will go ahead and give the floor to Marita. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Alexandra told you, my name is Marita Holfossen and I'm the general manager of the Trondheim Red Cross. Uh, I'm really grateful to, to be able to talk to you about our work and how, we will, how the volunteers make an important difference in the preparedness work in our city of Norway. Uh, we are more than, oh, now my screen is, I can't move my screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see, there. Uh, we were found, founded in uh, 1905 and we have more than 800 volunteers and we have 18 employees. So the Red Cross is more, one of more than 370 branches of the Red Cross in Norway, and our work is volunteer-based and organized to ensure that we can reach people in need quickly and efficiently. And in 2009, the King and the government recognized Red Cross as an auxiliary to Nor Norwegian authorities, also in peacetime. We used to have that also for, for, uh, for wartime and for conflict, and now we have, have it also in peacetime. This is the city of Trondheim, or at least the downtown of Trondheim. Uh, it's, we have a population of 213,000 inhabitants. Our city is loc uh, localized in the mid, mid, mid of Norway uh, by the fjord. 
And each year we also have uh, 30,000 students. Uh, we are a center for higher education and we house Norway's largest university. In the middle of the picture, you can see a large cathedral with a green uh, roof, and that's uh, the Nidaros Cathedral. It's Norway's national shrine and an uh, important symbol for our city as well as for the country. There's a lot of quick clay and poor soil conditions in our region. Uh, over 27,000 people in Trondheim lives in a quick clay zone. And the pink areas you can see on that map is lower risk areas. The bright red ones are high risk areas. And as you can see, there's a lot of red bright uh, on this map of Trondheim. Backlande in Trondheim. Uh, as you can see on this picture, uh, at the right where the river takes a turn towards the fjord, uh, is a quick clay zone in the highest risk class. Uh, that says a report from the Norwegian Directorate of Civil Protection in 2021. About 2,000 people live, uh, live there. There is a low risk of an avalanche here, but if it does happen, it can have fatal consequences. The risk of death and injury is high. The report has assumed a scenario where the avalanche triggers a tsunami uh, on the river of Nidelva. The report found that the water level could rise 12 meters and flood large parts of the area. Then 200 lives can be lost and 500 persons can be injured. The report states that there is only a 4% probability that an avalanche will occur in Baklana within 100 years. The probability is slightly lower in Baklana than in an average uh, avalanche zone due to the protection measures against erosion in Nidelva River and some control of construction measures, measures in the area. Because Trondheim has been one of the most active municipalities in Norway when it comes to mapping and dealing uh, with the risk of quick clay landslides. The municipality has introduced several measures to reduce the risk and safeguard urban development. Some of these measures are to have a separate department and equipment for taking uh, and analyzing soil samples, which is unique in Norway. Uh, to follow guidelines from the national authorities to assess the degree of danger, consequence and risk of quick lay zones. To carry out ground investigations and site visits to identify and monitor unstable areas. And to restrict and prohibit new construction or expansion of existing buildings in areas with high risk of quick clay landslides. And not and last but not least, to inform and guide citizens on how to prevent and manage quick clay landslides. The municipality has also established a collaboration with other actors to develop new technology and knowledge about quick clay and avalanche risks. And the municipality has also participated in many national and international projects on this topic. We have some tools that we are using in the Red Cross. Uh, we use this SIM, uh, a crisis information management system to alert volunteers and employees if something uh, happens. Like a missing person, someone with one with an injury who needs to be rescued for, from a hiking trip, or a wildfire or flooding where we need to assist the evacuation of the citizens. We have an emergency agreement with the municipality and an emergency plan with action cards. So we can be prepared and know what our roles are when something happens. We use a volunteer management system to better have data over the volunteers' competence, like driver's license, courses, and trainings. And the participation in the EU-funded project Engage, which started in 2020, has given us an extra possibility to learn, to evolve as an organization, getting a new and large network and a clear focus on preparedness work in Trondheim Red Cross. The preparedness guards are a solution from the Red Cross described in the engaged catalog of solutions. It allows volunteers in Trondheim Red Cross to be listed as preparedness guards, no matter if you are a visitor in the visitor service, the search and rescue teams, a refugee guide or some of our other activities. Then they get extra courses in first aid, psychosocial first aid and preparedness, and can be of assistance if an incident occur. You can also uh, sign up just as a preparedness guard if you don't are a uh, volunteer in any of our other uh, activities. And this way the inhabitants themselves can assist in a critical situation. The Emergency Preparedness Corporation in Norway is organized as a, cooper a cooperative between various public, 
voluntary and private actors, the police, the municipality and the volunteer organizations. The citizens are involved through the volunteer organizations and are given training and courses to be prepared. Cooperation as a way of working in rescue services and emergency preparedness work is unique to Norway. Through the emergency preparedness cooperatives, uh, appropriate and effective forms of cooperation have been developed between the public and voluntary resources, built on trust, proximity and local knowledge, a working method for interaction and cooperation, trust and common understanding. This has long tra tra traditions and has been a fundamental way of working for the Norwegian Rescue Service since it was formally established in the 1960s. The basis for all rescue service in Norway was a deep-rooted willingness to help when accidents happen. The rescue service concerns society as a whole, and the state uses its own resources while at the same time facilitating voluntary organization and private actors to contribute to their capacity and their expertise. The police, the municipalities, and the volunteers work together in a number of very different situations where life and health are at risk. The volunteers regularly cooperate with the police to search for missing persons and also assist in more critical incidents, such as major natural events, such as floods, landslides, or forest fires. The role of the municipalities is emergency preparedness cooperation is to ensure that the municipalities' inhabitants are taken care of when a disaster strikes. For example, the municipality is responsible for finding a place for someone to live if their houses have been evacuated. In this work, the municipality cooperate with both the police and the volunteers. About half of Norway's municipalities practice their emergency preparedness plans with, together with voluntary organizations. Volunteers are often called out when in search for missing hikers and when searching for people with mental illness. The organization most often called out is the Red Cross. However, there are large geographical variations. In some counties, volunteers are called out more than half of the rescue operations. In other counties, in less than a quarter of the operations. So now I have been giving you a little background uh, for, uh, for our way of working. Uh, and I will now talk a little bit more about the exercise joint effort or Övelse Samvirke, as it's called in Norwegian, on September 27th this year. This is the uh, same uh, area as you saw on the picture uh, earlier on, uh, from where the, uh, where the dome was uh, in the middle of the picture. Uh, and the scenario for this exercise uh, was as follows. Greyish color was observed on the Nidavari River, and smaller plots have been slipped into the river after days of heavy rain. Trondheim municipality has examined the site with geotechnicians and on the basis of these findings, the police have decided to ev evacuate an area in Baklande. And the, uh, Baklande is between the two uh, red areas on the right, you can see it uh, on the map. People in the area then received an alert on their phone, a public warning, telling them to withdraw from the area and sign up for evacuation and uh, next to kin center at Trondheim International School in a safe area of the town. Trondheim Red Cross was, accordingly to our preparedness agreement with the municipality, alarmed at nine o'clock. First, our crisis management team of Trondheim Red Cross gathered by phone, deciding to alarm the volunteers. Then the volunteers from the preparedness guards and the search and rescue team was alarmed and asked to go to the school. <clears throat> The municipality is responsible for the evacuees inside the gymnasium of the school, and the police are responsible for registration of the evacuees, and the Red Cross volunteers assisted in both, and also were taking care of the evacuees. The volunteers of the preparedness guard assisted with psychosocial support, and a team for search and rescue assisted with first aid to those who had minor injuries as a result of stress or ac minor accidents. A total of about 70 volunteers participated. This coordinated by Trondheim Red Cross crisis management team located outside the gymnasium. Tent and other equipment was brought to the site for assisting the municipality and the police. However, these tents were uh, in the exercise not used for citizens or evacuees, but for markers, observers, etc. And in this exercise, a lot of people participated. 70 volunteers, 170 markers, 20 from the municipality and the police, all of them from the city of Trondheim. 
Among the markers, we had four school classes from three different schools. Pupils in the age from 10 to 22 engaged in the exercise along with the teachers. In addition, there was around 30 persons from the consortium of the project engage from many European countries in the role of observers. So a total of uh, 300 persons attended. For many of them, this, this gives them an opportunity to engage in local preparedness preparations. And also an exercise like this gives the public information and we believe also some reassurance that the municipality and other stakeholders are prepared if something happens. A total of 144 markers were registered at the evacuation center through the police registration system in the three hours the exercise was ongoing. The police system is new and was tested for the first time on such a crowd of people and many learning points were learned. The system is based on using a mobile phone, scanning a QR code, and this had some difficulties. Not everyone has a mobile phone or have it with them. In crisis, many people may forget or do not have time enough to get the phone. And the system only handled English or, or Norwegian, so all other languages became a challenge. The system also required a, so, a social security number, something especially children may not know or may not remember. And in addition, there's the element of trust. Not everyone has the same level of trust in the police or, or the government and will therefore not be registered in such a system. This was the first time the police, the municipality and volunteer organizations interacted in exercise of evacuation on next of kin centers. And it provides both knowledge and network that we can be useful in future exercises and most important in real incidents. Now we know each other, we know the resource, resources each uh, one brings and who to contact if something happens. The exercise showed a need to strengthen the communication between police, municipalities and volunteers to better clarify roles and responsibilities and develop the registration system that will work better in uh, real life incidents. And we know the value of the volunteers. Each and every one of the volunteers have a background a civil competence that they bring with them along with the Red Cross competence. This is valuable in crisis and important to know of, and most important. In times of stress and fear, one might need a hand to hold on to, someone to talk to, or someone who gives you food or something to drink. That is often a volunteer in Norway, and for that they need to be prepared, to be skilled and trained, like in this exercise. This is some of our volunteers and some of the staff in the exercise we had. Uh, thank you for your time uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Marita. Um, so as I mentioned, we will have an opportunity to uh, ask questions at the end of the session. So if you think of any in the meantime, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, section or in the chat and we will address them later. So now I will pass the floor to Lalika and Emeline. So please uh, go ahead and share your screen. Yes, I will. Do you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Um, like I was announced, I am uh, Lika. I'm working for Hemlot as one of six uh, spokespersons there. And I work for the Free University in Amsterdam for the Links project. But you'll catch up with that uh, in the presentation. Um, well, Links is, the, is a European project. Uh, where the safety region of South Limburg, SciTech services and the Free uni University are involved in. Um, here it mentions SciTech instead of Camelot, but SciTech is the is a partner of Camelot who is re responsible for uh, safety there. And why I can't go to the next page? Sorry, guys. Oh, well, that works. Um, the Links project. Uh, Links is strengthening links between technologies and society resilience. And now I cannot read my whole screen. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. 
I have my own hat in my presentation. And now I cannot read the text. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, my head is gone. Good. Uh, strengthening links between technologies and society for European disaster resilience. Um, the overall aim of the links project is to strengthen links between technologies and society for improved European disaster resilience by producing sustainable advanced learning on the use of social media and crowdsourcing in disasters. Uh, in recent years, social media and crowdsourcing have been integrated into crisis management for improved information gathering and collaboration across European communities. But the effect effectiveness of, of social media and crowdsourcing on European disaster resilience, however, remains unclear owing to the diversity among disaster risk perception and vulnerability, disaster management processes and disaster community technologies across Europe today. While the LINKS project uh, consists of five cases in four different countries, Italy, Germany, and Denmark are also involved, and they are all dealing with various hazards. The case where Emmeline and I are working in is the Dutch case, obviously, and that's dealing with industrial hazards. Uh, those are the three partners. Um, the safety region of South Limburg, uh, the Netherlands are divided into 25 safety regions and uh, the safety region is a public organization that responds to large scale emergency situations and plays a major role in the risk communication in the surroundings. Then uh, SciTech services, as I mentioned before, that's a technical service provider for all organizations and facilities on the industrial site Hamelot. Um, they have uh, their own uh, fire department, a really specialized fire department, and they are, amongst others, uh, responsible for wastewater treatment. And SciTech is the partner representing Camelot in the Dutch case team. And then the Free University in Amsterdam, and Emmeline and I are both also a part of the team there. Our Dutch case team strategy, in short, our goal is to improve risk communication and disaster preparedness for those living in the surroundings of Camelot. Because Camelot is in a really populated area, uh, we aim to do this by establishing a foundation of trust with the local community and establishing a social network of relations with key fig figures from the community the so-called ambassadors. And we do this by organizing links community workshops and other links products. I'm sorry, this is a lot of text. You don't have to <laughs> uh, remember it all or you get the presentation later. But uh, Camelot is an industrial multi-user site and research campus. It's really big and many organi organizations are there like SEBIC, OCI, um, Arlang Seo, some very big international chemical uh, companies. Well, and any malfunction there can result in flammable, explosive and or toxic substances releasing into the air. A chemical fire can cause a lot of smoke and chemical substances can be carried with the wind to nearby residential areas. Less self-reliant people, such as children or the elderly, are less capable of bringing themselves to safety and are therefore at increased risk. Within links, we not only focus on the general populations, but also on the groups which we have identified that require more targeted information. Uh, these groups are healthcare institutions, schools, and shopkeepers. Here you can see um, the situation, which is really unusual because the factory is in the middle of uh, many residential areas, two highways and a railroad. This is another um, uh, picture with the direction of the wind. So the area is most likely to be infected if something happens. 
And this is what we try to learn everybody. What do you do in the event of a chemical incident? We call this card a meterkast card. Um, this is the one in English, but we only have the big one in Dutch. The message is really logic and clear. We thought at least at first, go inside, close uh, windows and doors, um, follow the news and uh, only go outside when, uh, when it's safe. But well, that causes some challenges. Um, like I said, it seems simple, but we uh, learned really quickly that although the message is simple, it's not really simple to, 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 to implement it for people. Um, because not everyone, not everyone knows how to turn off the ventilations. Not everyone has a radio or knows the frequency of the radio station. Some people think when they don't hear the siren anymore, it's safe. But well, we cannot keep the sirens on during the whole disaster, so that's not true. And for the chemical substances, they often have no color and no smell. So people often do not take the danger seriously. So there were several areas for improvement and several challenges, which are also supported by reports from official government agencies. I won't bother you with all the names of the institutions, but um, we, in our own research, um, totally agree with the reports that are, are earlier written. Uh, one of them is from the REVM, the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment. Uh, nearly a thousand people from the municipalities surrounding Camelot uh, filled in a questionnaire. Um, and then uh, REVM organized a focus group meeting in which the data were discussed. Um, so the research conducted uh, resulted in both quantitative and qualitative data. During the follow-up meetings they organized, civilians indicated that they are aware that they are at risk. In living next to an industrial site such as Hemlot, residents are also aware that through proper preparation, they can better ensure their, their own safety. Um, the REVM reports further indicate that initiatives will be started to increase cooperative resilience. This will be done, among other things, by informing people in the area about, about what they themselves can do to ensure their own safety. So we do that. The REVM reports also indicate that neighborhood ambassadors can play a major role in disseminating this information. Um, and it's about that ambassadors that Emmeline is going to talk. Great, thank you, Lika. Um, could you go to the next slide, slide please? Sorry, it doesn't work again. Oh. <laughs> it knew I was going to present, so now it's not working. <laughs> I'm pushing on the arrow like crazy, but it doesn't go any further. I don't know why. Um, I don't know. Maybe I have to short stop. Oh, yeah, it works. Oh, perfect. I don't know. <laughs> So uh, as Lika mentioned, um, there is, yeah, it's not as simple as, as we thought it would be. So uh, communicating about the potential risks uh, of the Camelot site. So um, yeah, what was revealed in the reports by the RIVM and by the EFA and also our own research within links um, is that people are simply just not, um, either not concerned um, or just um, not really uh, worried about what could happen. And um, so that poses a problem for us because, I mean, there is still the potential that something could go wrong. And, um, and we just, well, we need to create some risk awareness or at least we wanna improve the risk awareness for the surroundings. Um, yeah, so there's some challenges there. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Lika. So what we've decided to do, um, and it's based off of the research that's already been conducted, 
um, is that the best, well, ideally, um, we, we personally approach all these people. <laughs> But obviously, this would never work because there's thousands of people living in the surroundings at Camelot that are all equally at risk, uh, some more than others, but they're all at risk. Um, so it's just not possible for us. We don't have the capacity to, to reach out to all these people and inform them of what they need to do. So rather than informing everybody individually, what we have decided upon is to locate people in the community, uh, key players, so spiders in the web, who um, who are identified by the community or um, that, that play a major role in the community, um, identifiable figures, you could say. Uh, so examples include directors, um, uh, football coaches, a pastor, uh, an imam, a leader of a neighborhood watch group, or just famous people in the community. So or honestly, it could be anybody, but somebody who plays a large social role um, in the community. So uh, what we've done is we've um, basically conducted several workshops and uh, we've invited these key, key individuals to these workshops, uh, divided them into different workshops. So workshops for businesses, workshops for healthcare organizations, workshops for um, uh, shopkeepers. Um, and so uh, we invited these people, we gave them information about, okay, what do you need to do? What kind of information is important uh, for your organization? Uh, what do you need to know? What kind of challenges do you face as, for example, as a business? Um, uh, for example, you can't, you can't, as a business owner, you cannot force people to stay indoors. So it, all these things, it, it seems simple, um, but every, every group has their own problems. Um, so we focus on that in those workshops, but at the end of the workshops, we also inform these people, uh, or at least we ask them if they want to become ambassadors. So um, the importance of ambassadors is basically that these, these individuals help us to um, sort of reach the people in their network. So what they do is then they, uh, we provide them with, with information. So very simple messaging, um, um, and then they, they take that and they share that with their network, of course, um, not every messaging work will be as effective for that respective group. So, for example, if you have uh, a school, they might be more interested in our children's emergency cards, um, which are child friendly cards that explain all the steps that children will need to take to bring themselves into safety. And then maybe a neighborhood watch group would be interested in, in a simple WhatsApp message that they can share with their in their group. Um, so we have different different kind of messaging for all these different groups, and then we sort of coordinate with them to see what would work best for them. Uh, right now we're doing that in the cold phase, um, but um, we'll be seeing in the future this is also possible during during an actual incident during a crisis. Um, so yeah, so that's that's basically that, and, and then in the, in, I think on the bottom here it says. Um, yeah, that the RFAM also um, mentioned how um, yeah certain networks are just simply underutilized at the moment. Uh, social media channels that are available that are just not being uh, tapped into by disaster management organizations. So we're trying to do that now. Uh, next slide, please. So these are our first two pilot locations uh, for the ambassador program. Um, I've sort of already mentioned what kind of ambassadors we have. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of ambassadors or at least um, stakeholders. Um, yeah, and we started off with an area close to the Camelot site and an area a little bit further away, which gives us sort of varied uh, varied feedback during, during the workshops. And um, yeah, just very interesting results. Next slide, please. So the Links Community Workshops are, I mean, it's in the name, it's part of the Links project. Um, but um, we've sort of used this more for our own purposes as well, um, for just really locating those people in the community that can help us with our communication. Um, but the workshops themselves are also very important for um, yeah, fostering knowledge, um, making the needs in the community aware, and sort of going through these things with the community um, and identifying you know, what the problems are and then working these out together in person right away. Um, yeah, so personal approach, that's really what we wanted. Thank you, yes, perfect, next slide. So um, uh, yeah, so these were the first three uh, workshops. I know it's a bit confusing, but um, so these are the first workshops we did for the different target groups. And then we had the two pilot 
uh, workshops for the ambassadors, which later on we fused everything together. Uh, next slide, please. Into a whole bunch of different workshops. So over the past two years, we've conducted nine workshops um, for all sorts of different groups. Um, we've uh, yeah, later on, we started to indeed focus on the ambassadorship program. Um, and uh, originally, it was just, just for the stakeholders, just to get that um, community approach contact going. So, so yeah, now it's all part of the ambassador program. Next slide, please. So these are some nice pictures from one of the workshops. Uh, there's almost one for schools. It a very nice photographer. And there's some smiling faces in the audience, so that's good. Um, next slide. Yes, so here they're working in groups. So we, what we do is during the workshops, we um, of course let them know about what they need to do or what they need to know um, um, and what they need to do during an incident. And then we um, sort of let them uh, break out into groups, uh, discuss the challenges that they face as schools, you know, what kind of things um, would they also need to consider um, in their situation. So, and then we we take these uh, questions back into the main group. We discuss this, and then we um, try to solve these problems together. And then after the workshops, we send uh, a follow up with the main findings of the workshop, uh, solutions, um, and if people need help with their emergency plans, we we follow up with that on that as well, and we help them with their with their emergency plans. So, next slide. Yep, so we, we keep up with our ambassadors, we send the newsletters, uh, we keep up with the people that um, you know request extra information. What we've done with one of the schools, um, they requested an exercise. So what we've been doing is we've been working together with them to create a school exercise. We've created content for the school or just for honestly all the schools in the area, um, which is a child emergency card and um, a, a lesson that teachers can use in class to, to teach the kids about uh, the dangers of, yeah, I guess, Camelot. Um, next slide, please. So we also have some other community building activities. Uh, you can see me and Nikki here in the bottom right corner. Uh, that, that was a really fun workshop. Uh, actually, it was a booth. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're present at local events. We really try to be in the community, um, just be present, really, honestly. Uh, next slide, please. And um, we've also done um, a special visit um, to there's a, there's in the Lindehovel, so one of the pilot locations that we had. They're really um, the people that live there live very close to the site. It's so very there's a large there's a history reason for that. But um, um, so we gave them a little bit of extra attention, and we went by some of the stores there, and um, and asked like you know where's your ventilation system? Do you know how to turn it off? Uh, do you know what to do if if it, if there's a chemical incident? Um, and you can see here the emergency card in the bottom right um, that one of our colleagues is holding in his hands. So we pass these out during these visits. And I believe, yeah, so I've already explained. So we have a lesson plan for kids um, and we're developing all sorts of other things um, upon request. I think we also had a, a request from an imam and he said, hey, uh, it's great that you guys have these emergency cards in English and Dutch, but we'd also like it in Arabic. So. We're, we're looking into that right now as well and just making sure that um, that the community gets what it wants, basically. I think that was it. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you so much, Emeline and Mika. It was a really great um, presentation um, from all of the panelists. Um, so now uh, we have some time to take some questions and uh, you can um, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A section and I will read them out loud. Okay, so I have a question from Dennis. Um, so it says during education sessions given to the citizens on how to behave in case of technological accidents, did you provide information on how to react in case of a potential exposure to hazardous substances? Who wants to respond? Should I respond, Lika? <laughs> and if, if I don't give a sufficient answer, then Lika can possibly help me with this. Um, so during the workshops, we uh, of course provide uh, information on what you need to do. 
Um, so it's not um, basically if an, if an incident happens on the Camelot site, um, the dangers are that um, that you can basically breathe in. Uh, yeah, you can breathe in these these bad substances. It's always bad to breathe in smoke. Um, and it's not great to breathe in chemicals. Um, uh, so you, your eyes can burn from it, your throat can hurt from it. Um, and honestly, if you're on the market and you have your food out on display, um, it's not great for the food either if it gets on the food. So honestly, what we say is, well, we say these things. So um, best thing is to honestly just know what to do, to stay inside, you know, when you hear the alarm go off. And honestly, sometimes you don't even smell it or, or, or um see it so honestly it, it could be there and you wouldn't even know it so honestly if you hear the sirens go off you have to go inside and in the event that you do breathe it in well it probably won't kill you right away <laughs> um, otherwise you'll probably hear about that um, but never had a case where you instantly fall dead um, it's just that it's just not great for your health so you don't want to be standing outside for hours breathing this in um, but you certainly won't die if you breathe it in a little bit <laughs> Right, Nika? <laughs> yeah, we always in our messages say that I have to go to the website of the GGZ. I don't know how we call that in English, but it's that's the health institution that has a list with all hazardous substances and what you notice when you breathe them in and how you can yeah, cure yourself or yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. We have another question, um, I believe directed towards Lika and Emelina as well. Um, and this is, how do you expect the course material about chemical incidents to be used in the future? Um, so if I can answer this question. Um, so right now we have um, our colleagues, our Italian colleagues are actually working on this with us. Um, they're from Feel Safe or like Save the Children Italy. And I don't know if people know about, okay. Um, so they've actually posted our lesson on their webpage and uh, they've also posted the children friendly uh, emergency card. So um, we're making it so that it's, it's useful for everybody, anybody in the world that lives close to a chemical site, or honestly, um, it doesn't have to be that, it doesn't even have to be that you live close to a chemical site. I mean, you could, there could be an accident on the road and then, you know, you, you could be in a situation where you um, don't want to breathe that in. So then the same um, protocols apply. Um, so yeah, that's on the website. The website is not fully live yet because it's still um, being worked on, but the lesson plan will be on there and the children's emergency card will be on there and it should be useful for everyone. Um, and the lesson plan um, can be used during lessons. So uh, if a teacher um, decides like, hey, today we're gonna take 20 minutes to talk about um, chemical risks, then then it's literally, you can start it from the beginning. It's in English, it's in Dutch, um, and then you can just walk through and everything you need is in the, in the lesson. Hopefully that answers the question. We also have a question from uh, Federico. Um, he asks, what, specific type of training for people is available? Federico, I believe this question is directed to to Lika and and Emlyn, but I'm not sure. Um, so he asks, what kind of specific training for people is available? For example, first aid. Actually, we don't provide any training to people because we uh, as as Camelot, we don't we don't even have the means or the time. I mean, it's just the case go to go inside as quickly as you can and stay inside. Um, but um, organizations like the like the Red Cross or the Voluntary Fire Department, they do give they do give training, but we are not actively involved in that? I think it's more awareness. So what we're really focusing on is uh, risk awareness. Um, 
and just um, talking about, you know, the, the different steps you need to take. Um, um, so not specifically in any other kind of uh, training at the moment. We really um, don't want, like, we really don't want people to stay outside to help others in this specific case. So, yeah. We have a question in the webinar chat for Marita. Um, so this is from uh, Nike. I think I pronounced this correctly. I'm very sorry if I didn't. Um, so the question says, I'd like to know more about the role of volunteers within the Red Cross initiatives. Can company volunteers also get engaged as a team or a small group? And the second question is, what are your experiences with digital volunteering? Oh, thank you for the questions. Uh, for Yes, we can have uh, company volunteers or, uh, of course, uh, engaged as volunteers. They will, though, be uh, uh, trained in individually and they will also be called out or alarmed individually when something happens. But we, I know that people from the same, uh, same companies or from the same uh, a group of friends uh, actually joined together and, and became become volunteers in different kinds of activities, also in the preparedness guard or the search and rescue teams. Uh, and also for the digital experience, we had uh, we didn't have much digital experience before we had COVID. Then we had needed to uh, rearrange our activities so we can re reach the people uh, in need. So, for, for example, um, we had digital solutions for homework support uh, which helped a lot of young people especially also because they felt lonely and uh, many of them were were afraid and ne needed someone to talk to outside their family and friends and we also had uh, digital um, uh, volunteer volunteers uh, in the social inclusion where we, where we usually go to elderly lonely elderly elderly homes and visit them, we couldn't because of the the uh, danger of uh, getting infect infection spread. So then we used digital solutions so that they could have uh, someone to talk to or someone to to see on a screen. And actually, we learned a lot of elderly people how to use the the video function on the, on the Facebook Messenger because they already had the mess uh, mess messenger and used it for texting. Now we also taught them how to they use the video function so they can call their friends and families as well. Thank you, Marita. Do we have any other questions? I don't see any others. Um, so um, after this webinar is finished, we will have the recording and it will be uh, uploaded to um, the ENA website and our social media. So uh, we can, we'll have that available. And, um, and of course, uh, just a big thank you again to all of the panelists who participated today. It was a very insightful webinar and uh, I'm very happy that we could uh, have some experiences shared between us. So thank you so much again. And um, I hope that everyone has a nice rest of their day.